G'day, JC. Good morning, Wayne. Welcome to today's webinar, The Licensee Transition. Uh, we are about three, maybe five minutes away from kicking off. Uh, I've just chatted to our panelists and they're really looking forward to this one and sharing, uh, I guess, the tips, tri tips tricks, ta traps on how to find a good licensee, what you need to know going in and, and how it all works. Uh, we're going to give everybody just a few minutes to get ready. So this is your chance. Morning, JC. Thank you. Um, to yeah, grab your coffee, um, put your pants on <laughs> in this post-COVID world of ours. Um, but yeah, uh, most importantly, I want this to be interactive. So uh, if you have questions, queries, things you want to know, uh, I'm going to give you plenty of opportunity to sort of pop them in the box and I'm going to throw the questions at the team because um, these guys are very, very open to sharing everything they've learnt, which is why they're here. And equally importantly, uh, I'd love to make sure that you leave here with as much insight as possible. So uh, stay tuned and we'll see you in just a short moment. G'day Debbie, thanks for joining us. Uh, we are in the final stages of just uh, finalizing everything, giving people a little bit of time for coming in because I know recently there's been a yeah, whole bunch of issues with internet and all that sort of stuff. So um, you've got a few moments to uh, grab a drink or, or just get comfortable and uh, also have a think about what is it you'd most like to ask or learn uh, in relation to the topic today. Uh, so yeah, sit tight and I'll be right with you. G'day, Sam. G'day, Michael. Long time no see. Welcome, guys. Uh, yeah, we're just giving people a little bit of time to come on in because I know uh, with everything, all the challenges that come with working from home, I know internet is one of them. But uh, hey, thanks very much for joining us here today. Um, the guys are, are, are primed and ready to share with you uh, everything they've learnt about licensee transitions, both from a research, what you need to know. Uh, Stephen, welcome. Um, as well as sort of what they know having been through the process or in the middle of the process. Um, this is best done, you know, what is an interactive thing. I think even more so now than ever before. I personally prefer to have a bit of questions and a bit of talking uh, as much as possible and kind of get this going as a, as a group thing. So if there's anything you specifically would like to know, welcome, Don. Uh, if there's anything specifically you'd like to know about this topic and ask of the team, Feel free along the way or in advance, pop it in the chat box and I will do my very best to make sure we direct that question at the, uh, the guys. Uh, as I mentioned, we're gonna give people a couple of minutes just to stream in. So uh, if you need to get a drink or you wanna just get comfortable or whatever it might be, feel free. Uh, and then we're gonna dive into it. So I'll speak to you in just two shakes of a lamb's tail.
Okay, ladies, gents, boys and girls, uh, welcome to Friday. I hope you've had a good week so far. Uh, Martin, welcome. Uh, we've got double dons, which is always good. Michael, Sam, dude, always good to have you on board. Stephen, welcome, I think, for the first time. And Wayne, I think we've had uh, seen each other before. Uh, Debbie, thank you very much for joining us, and JC, of course. Hey guys, I'm really looking forward to this, and I think more so than ever before, uh, having the opportunity to sort of jump on one of these with you uh, on a regular basis to kind of touch base and, and cover off on some stuff, I think is uh, really helping to keep me sane and focused and all the rest of it. I hope things are going well for you. Uh, if they're not, or if there's challenges, although to be frank, most businesses I speak to at the moment are actually stepping into this. And uh, I saw a piece of research that came out from the IFA via, MLC via the IFA, which indicated that as a result, Jeff, welcome, as a result of what's been going on, guess what? Uh, we, uh, investors and, and clients are actually feeding back that advisors are one of the trusted sources of information. So guys, keep up the great work because um, my feeling is what's going on right now, we have the opportunity to address five years of uh, not entirely fair sort of uh, media uh, feedback and all the rest of it. Anyway, uh, by the way, for those of you who are sort of drilling down on getting things right, I want to share a little bit because um, one of the things I did last week within the program is Jen and I, Jen, here you are. We sat down and we, we just had a bit of a brainstorm. We said, okay, let's assume that things aren't business as usual. What are the things that we can do to kind of help people adjust to it? And we've identified there's probably six skills that people uh, probably need to get on top of over the next period of time. Uh, and they are in no particular order, well, in an order because they're on screen. Client communication, um, we're gonna cover that as a, as a priority. Having your value proposition really, really clear and able to be articulated. Obviously, not just remote meetings, but remote meetings like a pro. Being able to keep up that partnership contact. Ensuring that you as a team can work remotely in rhythm. And finally, yeah, ask, answering those questions about pricing models. So um, keep your eyes open. Uh, we're going to be running uh, these sessions. And to be honest, uh, because it's now where we're at, we're probably going to open some of these sessions to those of you who aren't necessarily on the program. So if one of those areas for you uh, is kind of a, a top, of, top of your mind or something you think you really need to get on, on top of, keep your eye open for the snapshot, visit the site, and it might want to, uh, you might want to yeah, come along. By the way, if one of those areas is of focus, you could really help me. Just pop it in the chat box and let me know so I kind of get an idea of where people are. We've been doing a bit of a questionnaire. So I know which ones to prioritize. Uh, yeah, so if you've got one, let me know. But without any further delay, do me a favor. Um, so we can just get the chat going. Can you let me know very quickly, what's your main motivation for uh, coming along to this webinar? What's the one thing that you would love to make sure that we uh, cover, uh, ask, outline? That'll give me a bit of a sense of, you know, what areas to focus on. So if you want to open the chat box for me, uh, JC's already been in there and said good morning, which is always good. Martin would love to know from you. Don, same, if you can just let me know, what's the main motivation? What's your reasoning for uh, coming along today? What's the thing you'd like to learn or get insight on? I would love to know. As with the panelists. JC, I'm looking at transitioning to my own AFSL, great. I know James is gonna be able to help you out with that. I mean, not, not actually help you out, but give you some insight. Sam would like to get some insights on how to market our new license to other advisors. I, what are people looking for? Hey, and I reckon there's a few people on here, Jeff, for example, who are really interested in that. Um, by the way, just to let you know, we have a really interesting mix here today. We have uh, some people who are uh, advisors and practice owners. And we have some people who support practice owners. So it's good to get a mix and, and sort of share things from different perspectives. Uh, um, by the way, the recording of this uh, is not going to be made public. So we can have this chat and please do me a favor, Chatham House rules, whatever goes on in here, let's respect each other and, and keep it quiet. Is that cool? Michael says, reviewing licensee options right now, I would like to understand the challenges ahead. Martin says, understand the different value that licensees offers. Don, the tips and traps of your own IFSL license application and operation, we can do that. Debbie says, efficiencies in process and understanding the technology that's out there. We're considering a new IFSL in the future and get tons of irregular emails. Thanks, Debbie. That's always good to hear. Stephen, thinking, uh, thinking of, of what a transition might involve, would like to gauge if uh, what the current offering is compared to out there. Perfect. Got some really good uh, stuff to work on there. And by the way, keep it coming. Um, we've got questions along the way. So let me give you a bit of an outline. Uh, one of our panelists, unfortunately, couldn't make it today. Uh, his son is actually having an interview, uh, I believe it may be a, uh, even a scholarship for Joey's. Uh, but he's, he's gave me some of his insights, so I'm going to be reading off this. But I wanted to introduce you to our other two panellists. 
Uh, James Williamson and Jeff Whitten, uh, as well as some of the businesses I've worked with the longest there, they've become two people I have a lot of respect for. And I may even go as far to say as, as they've become good friends. Uh, Jeff was one of the founders on our Leverage Advice program. Uh, and yeah, as well as being a, gr a great advisor, um, he's, also, he's also a rugby league referee. So when I said to the idea of we come here and people would throw questions at him, You'll understand he usually stands in the middle of a pitch with 13 huge rugby league players on each side arguing at him so pretty much nothing faces him. Um, James Williamson is, as well as, is, it goes even beyond just being a founder. He's actually my first client I ever engaged as an independent coach. Again, uh, he's got a great story to tell. Jeff's story uh, is a little bit different. Jeff, as a result of circumstance, uh, basically found out that his licensee was closing down. So it was one of those situations where he had to step forward and he's got a, uh, an interesting business, very strong, lots of different pieces going on. So he's gonna talk about it from the perspective of the have to. James, on the other hand, made a decision that his business model was probably best suited as his own license. And as a result, he's gonna give it from the perspective of you know, self-licensing uh, as opposed to uh, licensee selection and also understand you know, what, what goes on when you make that choice. So we've got a really good spread, but as I said, the best way to do this is if you let me know along the way, in addition to, to what you've given there, what you want to know, what are the questions you've got, and uh, let's get this going. That sound good? Okay. So without a shadow, well, a shadow of a doubt, why do I keep saying that? It's just not. Let's get Jeff and James off mute. Beautiful. Gentlemen, how are we going? James? Yeah, good. good. Jeff, James, was that an accurate introduction of you both? Sounds good. Sound yeah. all right? Yeah, it's fine. Fine by me. Yeah, I love the fact that, like, we were talking about, is there any questions you don't mind? And Jeff just looked at me, gave me that look, and it says, I, rugby, I, 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 I referee rugby league. I'll be fine. That's good. Gents, thank you so much for joining uh, me today. This is a really hot topic. When it went out, we had a lot of people uh, sort of have an interest in it, but it's also a topic that right here and now is, is very top of mind for a whole bunch of reasons. We've seen the, you know, the, the, the move to self-licensing probably increase certainly last year. On top of that, we've had a lot of situations where either licensees have um, chosen to sh shut down, have been forced to shut down, or alternatively they've had conversations with businesses about you know, their businesses not being viable moving forward. Let's start from the beginning. Uh, Jeff, let's start with you. For those who don't know you, might not have watched before, give them a bit of an overview of you, know, you your business, who you help, the history. Um, I started in the financial planning industry back in the mid nineties, uh, with NRMA financial planning when they had a, a very small operation. I think there was about 40 advisors there. Uh, and I stayed with NRMA through till they transferred over to the Clearview brand. Okay. Um, I then took the opportunity to move from there. I spent six months with a, an accounting firm, which was really good because it taught me that I wasn't suited to work in an accounting firm. Uh, and then I joined the guys at Dome. The, uh, when, I, when I joined Dome, it was a, a basically an insurance, uh, a personal risk brokerage firm or a personal risk insurance firm. Yeah. Uh, and the two principals at the time wanted to expand their business into financial planning. Okay. So we were licensed with, uh, with AXA FP at the time. Gotcha. And uh, so I joined those guys on a, on a, a pittance of salary as a salaried employee. Yep. Uh, I eventually was given some equity and then I um, broached the subject with one of them that, that we buy the, the third director out and we did that uh, about seven years ago now. Yeah, but roughly seven, six, seven years ago, um, my business partner at the time decided that he wanted to, to get out. Yep. Um, and so we looked at a, a few options of potential suitors that might want to buy us both. And then I said, look, if, I can't borrow enough money to buy you out. Will you vendor finance me out? Beautiful. And so I've gone from, you know, in 2002, a um, very lowly paid uh, employee to now the sole owner of the business. Right. And it's, it's a fairly significant business. You've got three locations, right? Yeah, three offices, um, four uh, authorised representatives, uh, including myself uh, in the business. We did have six. We uh, did lose a couple of just prior to Christmas. Uh, yep. so, uh, and that's what happens in this game. So, it's, At the same time, it's probably not a, not, a, not a situation right now where you'd want to be sort of in between roles or no. into a business. But okay, James, how about you? Give, give people the background to yourself and the business and 
Yeah. Okay, so I uh, came over to Australia in about 2001. Um, I'd spent my career previously in the UK in insolvency, so felt like I wanted to do something a bit more positive coming over here. So, uh, uh, no. Yeah, yeah. So, right. yeah, so I um, went to the planning world and worked for a couple of people and then started up the business in 2006 with two clients and, and really just built it from there. So we were licensed under uh, charter from about 2007 right the way up until a couple of years ago uh, and then uh, self-licensed but two ARs, uh, four support staff, uh, one office in Pimble uh, and at home now. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> so uh, this is my laundry by the way. <laughs> so my wife has the office and I get the laundry so um, uh, yeah, so, and it's been, you know, we've built organically, we, we made a couple of small, small book purchases along the way, uh, which some are better than others. And, uh, but ultimately, I think we're in a, a good place now. So it's taken time, but we're, we're very happy where we are. Love it. Yeah, I usually start off these webinars by asking people, let me know where you are. But I'm just assuming that most people are going to respond, I'm at home, dummy. So we just move on. <laughs> okay. Um, guys, let's, let's talk about the catalyst for this because, um, you know, uh, and I guess when it, Jeff particularly, you know, it's, it's, it's good to talk about sort of obviously when there's a certain thing that occurs, but also I'm also really interested in finding out, was this the only reason? Had you thought about it before? Let's start with Jeff. You know, what was the, what was the situation that made you suddenly go, okay, it's time for me to leave my current licensee and, and, and move? I uh, look, um, it was, it was the basis, the, the change for me was more around what was happening in the industry. Uh, we could see the writing on the wall with, I think it was Westpac were the first to move in their uh, self-employed licensees. Uh, and you know, that, that aspect of, of uh, moving with Securator and, and exiting, I've got a, a friend who's a, who was a Securator advisor. Yeah. Uh, so I could see a bit of writing on the wall there. I, yeah. um, I'd, I'd tossed up the idea of maybe getting my own license uh, before, but realistically, um, you know, the push came to shove and it was just simply a case where we knew that, that we eventually they were going to make a decision to, to close down the licensee. So yeah. I started looking uh, and eventually ended up with a letter in November that told me I had six months. So. Okay. And that, look, I have to ask when you got that different people are going to react to that. And I know I've had, conversations with some advisors who take it a certain way and other people take it a different way. What was your first reaction when you got that letter? Uh, good. Good. So I, know, so I know the end date. I know when I've got to have a decision by. Right. Um, and that was really it because I was, I was kicking the can down the road. I just kept, oh, you know, I'll, I'll make a decision by the end of September. Uh, I'll make a decision by the end of October. Uh, I think I ended up making a decision around about the middle of December. Um, okay. So, you know, it was just, it was good to get the letter that said you're on a limited time and it made me make a decision. So can I, I just ask, it sounds to me like to some degree you knew that the, the, the relationship or, this, or, or your time at that licensee was potentially coming to an end. Is that fair to say? Yeah. What, yeah, very what, much. What were the signals that indicated to you that maybe the, you know, the relationship wasn't quite as fruitful as it once had been? Uh, I think, you know, anyone that's been involved with an institutional licensee, the, um, the post Royal Commission, um, I've got to say craziness that came with, with um, compliance uh, and the, the loss of, of really a loss of support. Um, you know, the licensee used to, used to back us to provide uh, advice. They were now saying, well, no, we don't, we don't trust you to provide that advice anymore. Uh, we want to we want to vet every document that goes out. Um, so it was just a yeah, just I think I got to that stage where I said this is um, to me a, a different mindset to what I was used to. Yeah. Um, and and I didn't want to play their game anymore. Gotcha. Okay. Uh, James, you obviously different situation. You weren't pushed, or you, there was no uh, sort of event that sort of brought forward the decision. What was the situation that, that sort of was a catalyst for you going down that your route? Uh, well, it actually, it was multi, it, it was a couple of phases to this. Um, it really started after we, we joined Charter in sort of 2007. Then AMP bought out AXA in, I think, 2011, probably 2012, something around that time. Um, so we got then the influence of AMP upon our licensee. 
Um, so that was an interesting time. We then got to 2013 and 14 with the whole FOFA reforms that came through. And we'd actually considered getting our own license then. Yeah. Um, but I held off on that because I felt at the time it would be better to have the support of the bigger licensee through these, you know, these changes that are going on. That made, makes sense. I'm not sure that was a great decision in hindsight, but um, that, that is what it is. And then we really got to a point when, and look, I mean, everyone's got their own opinions about licenses and companies, but for us, the AMP model and the influence of AMP upon us as a, as a firm really was, a, was negative for us and our clients. So we had to make a decision to move in another direction. Uh, uh, and uh, so in 2017, I decided uh, we need to start planning to move to our own license, yep. which we did, uh, which we eventually got in February 2018. Okay. Now, I, look, this isn't a licensee. I don't want this to turn to a licensee bashing or an institutional bashing. Uh, the day, no. There's some great licensees out there who do a really good job and it's, you know, it's, it's challenging and there's some great institutional. Let me understand the institutional influence on your business, where did it start to become clear that maybe the model that you were building was different from the model that the institution was, was um, resourced up to support? Uh, so for us, it was really around, I, I think some of the bigger licensees, or I'll just use that generic, there is a, there is a, they tend to cater to the lowest common denominator in the group. Um, and okay. the problem with that is it makes everyone jump through the same hoops. And I think there is a disconnect between the direction of the ARs and the licensee as a whole. So I don't think any, I don't think everyone's pulling in the same direction. And that was very much the case for us. We felt the licensee were very much doing what they wanted to do to protect their license. And I understand that as a holder of AFSL license now, I get that. <laughs> Um, but I think there was just there's just different cultures that, and there's lots of different cultures under these AR models. Um, and the problem is, if you don't fit, um, it can be quite disruptive to your business. Yeah, that makes total sense. And I yeah. mean, if, in about 2000 and God, 2007, I was at Hill Ross and I was asked to go and do an analysis at the time of the reason why practices wouldn't want to get their own license. And they asked me to come at it from a financial point of view. And when I actually looked into it, there was no financial case. We'll talk about that a bit later. Mm -hmm. But um, the, the truth, the, the recommendation I made at the time was, if you are a business where your business model is sufficiently uh, deviating from the licensee supported business model, and you're happy to take on board things, then in some cases, it actually makes sense to, 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 to sort of do that. And I think that's yeah. the thing. If you're a licensee, ultimately, you have to control the free radicals. But if you're a business, especially if you are a free radical and you need to be able to control your own destiny. So it's, yeah, it's one of the challenges. Jeff, did you want to add anything to that? No, it, it, he nailed it really because it was the same thing there is that just a disconnect of where we wanted to be to where the, the licensee wanted to be. Interestingly, I don't know if there's an answer to this. You may have thought about it. If not, then that's cool. But if you look back on that, is there anything you think uh, you, if you were in their position, you would have done differently as a licensee? to solve that problem or do you think it's just inevitable? I, yeah, there's a, a lot of things that I think they could have done differently. Um, I think that we, as being part of, and I've, I've been part of large licensees for, you know, we went from, AM, from, from AXA through to financial wisdom. Um, and to be, to be honest, I think there's a lot of times where um, management of those licensees could have, uh, and I'll use the word take a stick to the, um, to those that were causing the problems. In other words, uh, punish, punish them. Well, or just pull them into line to say, look, you know, this is the way that you need to act. I, I use the example of, of the um, imposition of software that's needed. So, you know, we've, we've seen most of the, the licensees go down a, 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 a path where they mandate the software that you want it to be used. Yeah, because it assists them in their compliance role. And I fully understand that. And I appreciate that. I've got no problems with that yeah. at all. When you've got advisors that say, I don't want to do that. To me, that a conversation should be, we need you to do that for this reason. If you don't want to do that, we need to know how you can remain with us. 
Yeah, it's it's. You know and what they it, just yeah, nobody yeah. wanted to make. I, I don't believe they wanted to make those tough decisions. And you know, we've we've come a long way from a sales culture, but some of us haven't. That's fair. That's fair. And it's, it's ironically, it's the same as you you would be with your clients, Jeff. If they're not yeah. willing to take your advice and follow, then they're not a client anymore. But yeah, um, James, do you want anything, or should we should we move on and talk about the search? No, that makes sense. I think Jeff nailed it pretty much. So. Good. Uh, I want to share a little bit. Uh, I'm going to share sort of some uh, some of what Matt sort of uh, shared with me, and he said, "Look, similar for him, one of the biggest challenges that he found was the additional compliance regime. It made it more and more difficult, which is kind of echoing what you guys have said, which is um, there were checks and balances put in place to manage everybody as if there was a risk amongst everybody, and uh, certain requirements I think around." Um, practice succession, which is starting to come to the fore, you know, requirements that you group together or semi, have a semi-agency situation, which almost feels like we're going back to the, to, to the future, back to the past a little bit more. And I think, yeah, anyway, let's talk about the search. And obviously at the bit, you, you make the call, which is the first step in the process. And then you realize that either you have a time frame or you have a desired time frame, and you go out there and you start looking, right? Um, you know what, James, you can go first this time. Um, how did you go about finding your new home? Well, I think we had a sort of a, a little bit of confirmation bias. We sort of know, knew we wanted to go towards our own license, but we did, go, we did go through the process and we did speak to a lot of licensees out there. So it wasn't just, this is what we're going to do. I wanted to know what was out there before we actually, I suppose, came back to what we thought was the right decision, which was our own AFSL. So we did speak to a lot of people and, and really just, I suppose, speaking to everyone uh, out there, it really confirmed what we already knew, that the only way we were going to get what we wanted is by doing it ourselves. So, Sorry, go on. yeah, so that, that was really what it kept coming back to. I kept coming up against roadblocks and, you know, and, and I don't think we do anything particularly different from any other good holistic advisor but the the roadblock seemed to just mount as as I spoke to different people but there was also a lot of promises made yeah that I didn't believe okay <laughs> so and that's perhaps you know probably a little bit cynical from past experience but um and and look I, I Jeff would be the same we all you all speak to people in the industry all the time so we hear all the war stories and we know, you know, advisors are pretty well connected and they do talk to each other. So you do know what's going on. Um, so I think it's a, that, that was a, an interesting part of that process. Um, but look, the reality was it just came back to we knew we were going to be better off on our own. We were, we were self-isolating ourselves, put it that way. <laughs> um, yeah, can we get really practical? Um, when you went about, I know you're, you, you're yeah. a, a, a really good networker, but what is, if you're saying, if someone's out there and saying, you know, I, I need to talk to other advisors and now I think it's one of the best ways of doing it. What do you, what do you find the best avenues of having those conversations with other advisors and finding out their experience when maybe a lot of your experience has been within that, that licensee so far? Uh, yeah. So, so when I went through, I just, I just grabbed a heap of people I knew at different licenses and went and spoke to them, whether it's over coffee or lunch or on the phone. I just, really trying to get as much information as I could and trying to get it, you know, as much off the record as you could, you know, you didn't want to, I'm not, uh, you know, I, we all got to do formal things at times, but you, you always get the best insight when you're talking informally. Yep. Um, and, and really just trying to get a sense of, you know, specific things that I knew would be a problem for me and drilling down with those particular people and trying to get a sense of how that licensee actually operated on a day to day basis that helped us make that decision and how it applied to us. Now it, it will be completely different for someone else because we, we all have our own little things that we like and mm. dislike. Right. So this is certainly not a, a template for this is right for everyone because it's, yeah. it's just not, it, it depends on you as an advisor and what type of advisor you are and what clients you look after and all sorts of other factors. So, uh, but that, that's what we did. We just spent that time, and I reckon it probably took me a good six months to have those conversations. Yep. You know, which is. That's a lot. That's a, that's a decent amount of time, but you, I mean, you, you had a very clear time frame as to when you were doing things. Yeah. 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 
Jeff, how about yourself? What was your approach? Did it differ from that? Did you? I mean, obviously, you were looking very specifically for a for a, for a licensee. Tell me Actually, more. Actually, I I started with the idea that I was going to be self licensed. Um, as okay. you said, we've we've got three uh, three offices. We've got a reasonably large um, operation. Um, cost wise, we could probably have, have uh, you know done the own license thing. Um, probably cheaper than what we could for a, a, a licensee. Yep. Uh, I went to a, a information day. I can't remember who held it. And there was a, a panel talking and one of the guys said that he, that they got their own license and somebody said, how, how much time does it take mm. you to run the licensee? And his response was, Oh, look from the office point of view, about a day a week. Uh, from my point of view, probably a day a fortnight. And okay. I said to myself then, and I said, I don't have a day a fortnight now. And that was the, the catalyst that said, forget your own license. You're not, um, you're not organized enough uh, and you're not, um, you know, you're not willing to, to put the, that hard work into that side of the business because you don't enjoy it. And, okay. that was, and that was then said, right, now I've got to go and find a licensee. So what are the parameters that I'm, I'm pulling out here? So when you went, to, um, yep. actually, James, let's talk about that better. You, how has that been? How does that reflect your experience of running your own license time-wise? Yeah, look, so a lot of time put in initially to get it where you need it to be, no doubt. Uh, I reckon, you know, the the first year of running the license was pretty pretty full on getting the systems and processes right to run that license properly, uh, and I and I, I think we're still tweaking that as we go forward. Um, uh, a day a week, yeah, maybe, maybe a day four night. Um, but I think if you get the processes right and the systems right, uh, it's not as onerous as some people make. And, and also making sure that you're partnering with the right people. This is, I think, crucial. It's not just about trying to do all this on your own. We don't do it on our own. We have partners that we work with on the compliance side that assist us in doing that. So, it, and we pay for that service, right? So yeah. it's, not, it's not about doing it, but with those right partnerships, and the right processes and systems in place, uh, I think we have a reasonably good setup now. But now a lot, I, fair bit of work to start with. Knowing both of you, that I know that your personality types are certain that you're, you're a very systems thinker, James, you're very detailed, you're a real detail person. That's not to say you're not, Jeff, but I know that you prefer to spend your time differently, right? Yes. You, you can say that I'm not sure. You know me that well. I, I, it's actually not about detail. It's about it's about enjoyment. James actually probably if if, you, if, you, if he's honest, he'd say he probably shouldn't spend as much time as he does tweaking the processes and sure and, uh, because he doesn't enjoy it and he gets too deep in it. Same deal here. And and at the same time, Jeff, if you just spend the rest of your life sat down building processes, you'd probably be pretty miserable straight away. You're yeah. a, you're. I mean. That struck me when I, when I was talking to a lot of people, particularly Rhett Das, who has been really helpful in this, and Sam Hawke, they, they made that comment. They said, be really aware of who you are and what you enjoy. Because if you don't enjoy the detailed stuff, maybe you shouldn't be running your own licensee. If you do, then you may have that really quickly. Would you say that's fair? Yeah, I would. Uh, yeah, I think it's probably fair. Uh, to, to a point, I, I think you can, if, you, if we take your advice, Stu, and we, we delegate properly, so, you know, um, you can actually hand some of this off to key staff members to do, which I do do. Um, so there are key staff members that do certain things as part of running the license. And we split that up. We don't have a dedicated compliance person as such, but we have key areas where key people are responsible for key things. Got it. So you can, you can absolutely do that. So, so That's really useful. So let's, before we move into the transition piece, and by the way, if you're... Everybody who's, who's, who's listening to this, if you've got any additional questions, pop them in. But in the meantime, can you, can you just let us know what's been the most useful thing we've spoken about so far? Put that in the chat box. Can um, I just make a point, Stu? Uh, just on that, just from a license, just run, running your own license. What I, the one thing, the big thing I took away in the first 12 months was I actually think that the detail and the minutiae that we had to go into in terms of understanding the responsibilities as a responsible manager of a license and the licensee process, I think has made me a better advisor. Okay. For what reasons? Well, I think you get a much better understanding of your responsibilities as mm. a, an advisor in terms of how you deliver advice and what are the responsibilities of your advice process, etc. 
So and it's not to say that we don't know them because we do, because we've been, we've all, and Jeff would be the same. We've been doing this a long time, right? You sort of do know your responsibilities, but it's quite interesting when you go through the detail. So I do, I actually do have some, some sympathy for the compliance people at the big licensees. Yeah. It, it is quite a, it is a burdensome job and, and there is a lot of detail to it. Um, but I think it's important as an advisor to try and have some understanding of that. So. Beautiful. Debbie says what James is saying is really good to hear that first 12 months will be difficult, but processes are important. That really speaks to me. Yeah, me too. Yeah. And I guess the other thing to point out is, um, uh, is the fact that Jeff, you're not just managing, I mean, James, you're, you're managing a business. You've got an, you've got a team behind you, but Jeff's also got other advisors in the business, which eat up a lot of time. So, um, it's again, different strokes for different folks, so to speak. Michael says discussion has been helpful about the choice between the two. So let's just sort of bring, home this piece around uh you know when you're out there and you're looking and you're assessing because i i it's like anything it's really really easy to get um sort of waylaid or, or attracted by certain things you think are important but they're not what's your biggest tips for when you're out there looking for a new home things that you suggest people do or don't do in no particular order just jump them out and i'll, I'll talk to them um ask ask for information and and ask for 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 copies of things i i wish i'd had been a bit more vigilant in getting uh information out of um prospective licensees yep beautiful because they'll all promise you the world james uh examples take the licensee through an example of a client you have and see how they would deal with it from an advice point of view and a compliance point of view love it work on an actual case study yeah, and I did it with a, uh, one of them, I won't mention any names, and I got a very clear picture very quickly that they weren't going to be the right fit for us based on that particular client. Perfect. Any others? Uh, I think the licensee needs to be the right fit for the right, what type of advisor you are and what type of clients you're giving advice to. So, and, and I, I'll just use some, you know, if you're just doing very basic advice that's not too complicated, then maybe an AMP or an MLC model might be right for you or, you know, one of the bigger licensees. If you're doing bespoke or complicated multi-entity strategies with clients and, you know, et cetera, maybe a more boutique or self-licensed might be a better option for you. I think it depends on what type of advice you are and who you're giving advice to. Yeah, perfect. What, anything else, gents, that you think is really important? Yeah, that, I, following on from that, um, having, having a variety of, of advisors in my business, I had to balance all of that. So it's just, it, you know, I take on board what James is saying, and it is true. He's trying to get that balance across the board. So can, you, can, they, can they deal with the outliers as well as the mainstream? Love it. Try to find the balance. And, um, yep. The other, the other thing would be how they how they deliver advice. So the big thing for us has been how we deliver advice to a client. Um, yeah. No one likes SOAs, right? They are Asic. horrible. Asic <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I don't think they even like them. <laughs> I think they're just they're just horrible documents. So how how people deliver their advice, I think, is really important. And I think that is something that's going to change dramatically going forward. Um, I because I think even after this particular crisis we're going through, it'd be what is absolutely important right now is you need to deliver your client's advice right now because some clients are in crisis and being able to deliver that efficiently and quickly and cheaply, I think is more important than anything. Yeah, I agree. Well, you know, in my view, I think portals in future, it won't be an SI. Maybe, be a yeah. Portal. You build it together over a period of time. But Maybe, yeah. Um, a couple of others I wanted to pull out. Michael Gerskoff from Lifespan was, a, uh, was kind enough to sort of send through his thoughts. I think Michael's always a really interesting dude to speak to. He said, get copies of all key current documents, including fact find, risk profiling tool, APL, SOA plus ROA templates, FTS, FSG, past new letter, marketing content. And I guess if, if you can't get hold of it, that's probably a red flag straight away, which I know Jeff will probably agree with me straight away. Very uh, much. He said, never believe possible bullshit featuring buzzwords around culture and be skeptical <laughs> about our support services uh, unless it can be demonstrated. 
you know, how it's given. Um, one of the things that uh, Matt said he did is he sat down and we I, I, we sat down this together is actually go through and, and get clear about what he wanted, uh, make it about seven criteria and then weight those. So whenever you're scoring services, you're doing it through the, the lens of what you actually need as opposed to, you know, the, the how well the proposition is put forward. Yeah, I agree with that. Uh, but I think, yeah, that that thing about make sure that you can cite what, the tools that you're going to be asked to use, you should be able to look at them before you, before you jump in, agreed? Yeah, absolutely. Um, Elizabeth says that what she's taken from this so far is to delegate and do what you like doing. Yeah, <laughs> do that in life. I think you, that's a pretty good uh, rule. Should we jump into the actual experience of transitioning? Sure. Yeah. yeah. Do you want to go first on this one? Uh, you're kind of, you're still part way through this, right? Yeah, so we're only, we're only new. We've been with our licensee now just, just under two months. Okay. So if, you're, if someone else is, is looking at how to go through this or how to transition or what they need to know or what they can prepare for or, you know, the mistakes that maybe will slow them down, what would be the main things that, from your experience that have either um, gone smoothly or, yeah? Yeah, probably getting, getting a lot of support around uh, how they want you to do business. So being with a licensee, they want to vet the advice that you're giving. Uh, you know, you, you've thought that you were giving good advice. Your previous licensee thought you were giving good advice. The new licensee may say, oh, there's just some things that we'd like to see changed. Right. Uh, so it's, it's getting the support there uh, along the way. Okay. Um, and I think the, one of the beauties of, of, of not having your own license is being able to outsource a lot of the uh, remuneration transition. Okay. Just putting, you know, we you know, filled out a, a multitude of forms, but somebody fixed all that up. Um, and, I, and I know that I'm paying for that privilege, but it's something that I'm prepared to do. So outsource things like the, the REM? Yeah. Anything else? Um, no, that, that's really about it. it it's, you know, realise there's a, there's a much greater cost. Um, you, you might have to have, you'll have some marketing that will need to be done, you know, new business cards, new yeah. brochures, whatever it might be. Um, okay. How's the team been able to adapt to it? Uh, yeah, they're, they're adapting pretty well. Actually, there's a, there's a few of them adapting better than I am. Uh, <laughs> sure. Um, but they're, you know, I'm a, I'm a bit of a why person. Why, why do we need to do that rather than just do it? Yeah. I'd like to know yeah, why. I think it's good. Mm. And um, is there anything uh, that's just has been a lot easier than you thought it would be? Uh, no. <laughs> no, there's nothing that's been easy. Right. Um, it's been, we've, see, we've gone to a completely new software. Our, our licensee has proprietary software and, yeah. and uh, it, it's great and it, and it does a lot of things, but it's, it's a struggle at the moment just to get on top of. Okay. And how, how do you approach training? Because I know the thing is a lot, a lot of people hit problems, particularly with software is a big one. And a lot of the time, if you, I like to eliminate two things before we start to look at it. And one of them is, have you actually done training? And are people actually investing time to use the new stuff? Because if those yeah. two things aren't being done, then every other problem is secondary. What's yeah, look, we're doing, we're doing a lot of Zoom meetings with our support. Uh, and we're also, the, the software itself has um, inbuilt video training so okay so that you're insisting on the team actually doing the training yeah i'm i'm actually joining them a lot of the team are actually organizing training and i'm joining into that beautiful so. james um yours in terms of the transition would have been a lot more hands-on do you want to tell us a bit about how you went about it yeah so uh, probably a little bit different from jeff because it wasn't forced on us we had a, probably a little bit more time to prepare which i think is a, a key part to this preparation is really important so you know I, I could quite easily say we had a 12 month run up probably to getting the license which is probably mm -hmm. fair um so a lot of planning around that so we did a you know how much i like to plan out my processes in terms of my timelines so we did a yeah. fair bit of that uh prior to starting the process um yeah. understanding what we were going to have to do obviously literally from a day-to-day -day point of view Things like, you know, when we actually get our license, what SOAs are we going to have to do for every client? Um, 
what communications are we going to have to have with each client? Um, so making sure you're just getting your ducks in a row, you know, yeah. um, but, you know, and then also looking at things like, well, what, what's your new offer? Are you having a new offer under your new license? Obviously you're changing the way you're doing things. What's your new offer look like? What are your fee schedules, what are your inclusions, you know, being really clear on all that as part of that yeah. transition. Um, obviously understanding the compliance burden and that's a, that's a learning curve. As I say, that, that can take up to 12 months, but really being clear on what you need to do from a licensing point of view and what your obligations are to ASIC as part of that. Um, uh, things like Jeff mentioned, revenue transfer. Um, we actually got someone to do that for us as well. So, um, uh, which again, but that was certainly worth doing. Things like, you know, watching out for things like um, PI cover runoff. Yep example um so so all of these things are things that you've got to take into account as part of that transition but it's just about sitting down at the beginning and working out where all these pain points are working out where they're going to be in the process and then obviously putting a small plan in place for each one about how you're going to address it question for you both how did you position this with clients did you Do you want to go, Jeff? Yeah, mine, mine was easy. Um, I told them that the licensee was, had made the decision to shut down and therefore we were being moved on. Right. <laughs> Don't pull punches. Oh. Not, you know, and, and simply said, look, they're, uh, they, what they do is they provide a support service to me. Um, we have found another, another group to provide us that support service. This is the difference between the two. One was owned by a major bank. The other one is privately owned. Um, you know, I'd done my due, I've done my due diligence. I know where I, I wanted to be. Um, and I haven't, I don't think we had any pushback at all. Yeah. So did, like when you say pushback, did you just, was it more, was it one of those, oh, okay, whatever. Or was it a couple of questions and they moved on? Was there any? Uh, usually, uh, you know, who are these people and, and you know, what's their role? Gotcha. Perfect. James, how about you? How did you position the whole thing? Uh, well, obviously, you position it as a good news story, right? That's what you've got to do. You've got to, you've got to get in front of it. I think it's an absolute opportunity to get in front of every client, talk about how you're going to provide that ongoing service to them going forward. It gives you an opportunity to potentially do an SOA for them. And I know that costs money and time, but I think it also gives you an opportunity then to reposition fees and services. So you would know very, you obviously know what we did in terms of our fee uplift and how we did yeah. that. Uh, so it also gives you an opportunity to jettison some clients along the way um, because the, 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 and look, that's just the reality of where, where you know, not always going to, not all, every client's going to be the right fit for your business. And we're seeing that as we move forward. And as the cost of advice gets uh, more burdensome, that we're seeing the clients obviously are not fitting into the model that we have. And, and look, that's obviously sad, but it's about then finding them a new home potentially. Um, so I think it, it really gives you an opportunity to do all of that as part of that. So it is a very much a good news story. And I think you've got to paint it as that. Um, you know, you, you, you talk about independence without saying you're independent, of course, because you can't say that yeah. uh, unless you actually are. Um, but I, 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 I didn't have any, any negative feedback from the conversations we had. Some clients didn't care, I'll be yeah. honest. They didn't, didn't care. Some clients were just you know, whatever, James, and some were really, really positive about it. So, Elizabeth, you know what, Elizabeth, I, 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 now that I think about it, I should have had you on this because Elizabeth actually had one, one of the most extreme examples, which is she was under the Dover license, Dover licensee. And uh, there were two practices I, I've worked with who were impacted by that. And both, to, to your point, were, were great advisors didn't, and did nothing wrong. Actually, in fact, had, gave very good advice but they had 30 days to do it. And she said the same thing there. Thank you for sharing Elizabeth. And what an oversight on my part, which is she, can't, she said the same thing and clients said thank you and all the best. So yeah, it's, it's, it's not as much of an impact. It's more of an impact on the back office, right? Mm. Yeah. Um, I'm interested, uh, what did you change? Did you take the opportunity to change anything with clients when you went through this process or did you just leave it as, as similar as possible? James, you're smiling. Yeah, you know me. I love changing stuff. My staff <laughs> hate it, but I, I, I sort of love changing stuff. Um, well, I'm a big believer in, especially in this massively changing environment we're in right now, and the industry that we've been in for the last 
number of years but if you're not in front of this you're behind it and you don't want to be behind this so i i, I believe you have to change and you have to can change continually to keep in front of things yeah. um now some people don't agree with that that's okay um but for us it we took this as an opportunity to to rip things apart basically so it's not quite back to a white piece of paper and start again but it was a real opportunity to really look at everything within the business and how we did it how we wanted to do it but what we're going to be happy doing going forward and, and then take it apart from there so what's, what's one thing that you change either with clients or in the way you work which has been most obvious or most useful um i think the big one now is that we don't do an initial we don't charge an initial fee for soas um for example, so we, we say to a client, we're, you know, we're, we're engaged them for a 12 month period. So they come on board for a 12 month period. Uh, we might do one, two or three SOAs in the first 12 months, yep. but they're paying a, a, probably a slightly increased fee for the first 12 months to do that. Um, because we're saying to the clients that, you know, as soon as we write you an SOA, it's wrong. <laughs> right, which it is, it, that's just fact. It's, so you, I think you have to be agile in terms of how you deliver that advice over the first 12 months to make sure you get them where they need to be. Case That's in, probably the big change. The case big in point, if you wrote an SOA for a client four weeks ago and they come back to you. Totally <laughs> different now, right? Going back to the beginning. Jeff, how about you? Do you? As part of what you're going through, what you've been through, have you taken the opportunity to change anything with clients or... Yeah, similar, similar situation, as you know, Stu, we've, we've looked at our fees, we've looked at... Uh, the cost of servicing clients, uh, you know, and trying to take that on board now and, and putting it into place. It's hard because you've, what you've really explained to clients is that it's not because of the change of licensee that you're, um, you know, you're no longer able to assist them mm. uh, for the level of fee that they pay. It's got to do with the, the changes to the industry uh, and the requirements that are, that are needed for us to, to be able to, to do this. Well, in, in some ways, the, the reason why the licensee closed down is because of the, the financial aspects of it, which is you're increasing your fees, so you don't have to do the same thing they did. They just couldn't, couldn't make a business out of it. And I guess at your level, you don't want to be able to, you don't want to have to say that. Well, no, and that's, that's the thing with it. And, and I suppose the, the other thing that we're still trialing now, that part of this, this new software and things is things that we've never had access to before. So digital signatures and mm -hmm. the like, you know, being able to do a lot more electronically uh, and these, these last, you know, two to three weeks is really coming to the fore of, of what can be done. Uh, and I asked the question as to, you know, will we work the same again ever? Or, no. or is, this a, is this a permanent change in the way that we do things? Well, let's put that out. We've got a good group of people here. I'd love to hear from everybody on, uh, um, on the call. What do you think? Well, firstly, you know, first part of your answer put, do you think we'll ever work the same again? Yes, you think we'll go back to normal? No, we think things have changed. And secondly, just after that same line, put what do you think the main thing that will never go back if you, if you think that's the case? Um, I'll ask the question of you while everyone's doing that. Jeff, what do you think? Obviously, you think everything's changed. What do you think? Yeah, I, do. I, I think the, the requirement to, to physically sit in front of a client um, is no more. Uh, because clients re are going to realise that um, they can do this video conference thing, they can do this telephone uh, thing. Not right. that they won't want to sit in front of you, but it's not a requirement to do yeah. that. Agreed. Uh, Jane, what, yep. Sorry, keep going. No, no, I was just going to say that the ability to work from an, uh, not from a central location. James, what do you think? Do you think it'll go back to the way it has or some things will stick? Oh, no, I think it's going to change. I, 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 and I agree with Jeff completely. I, maybe ASIC will re realise you don't have to actually sit in front of someone to deliver a review, and you can actually do it through other means, which would be nice. Um, but, yeah, no, I think it, look, it's, we're already looking at this and saying, well, this could be a real a silver lining to all this as, yeah. as much as it can be. You know, we could maybe have one sit down with a client a year and all the others are done remotely via Zoom or whatever it is you're using. Um, this actually could be a cost saving for financial planning businesses. And I know from my experience, I'm sure everyone else that's done this before. I know when I do a zoom review with a client, it's probably half the time of what a normal review is. Cause I'm not waffling about rubbish that I normally waffle about when I'm talking with a client, you know? 
in, in, a, in an online environment, you've got 50 minutes until people's attention starts dropping if, if you're lucky. Yeah, I, I agree. Yeah. Um, I'll, I'll add to that. Please, guys, I'd love to hear from you. Don, Elizabeth, what do you think is going to change or stay the same? I think communication between advisors and their clients, uh, I think that will stick. I think this, this desire to pay more attention and want to communicate with people, I think that's going to stick around. And I think a number of times I've worked with advisors on communication and they come back, but I don't want to bother clients. I don't want to fill an inbox. I think that's going to change. Yeah. And that's changed forever. Uh, Don, thank you so much. He says, uh, Don says coronavirus is a game changer. Much more online interaction, perfect opportunity to transition tech-phobic clients to more efficient platforms. Bingo. Hey, Don, thank you very much for dropping that in. I'd love to hear from other people. Guys, this has been awesome. I want to ask one question, and let's go into... We've got a few questions that I'd love to ask before we sort of run out of time. Please, guys, let me know what you think uh, has changed. Um, uh, independence. Do you think clients value it, or do you think we're blowing hot smoke up our own bums and thinking that it's a value proposition to differentiate. Mm -hmm. James. Um, I might go for, look, I actually think I've changed my view a little bit on this over the years. I didn't think independence was a, a thing at all. I thought it was a bit of a load of, not rubbish, but I didn't think it was that as important. I think as, I think the thought process in the industry is probably changing a little bit. Mm -hmm. I think with the, the code of ethics, whether you agree with them or not, mm. have fundamentally changed the way we interact with clients and the the trans, you know, the how transparent we have to be with clients on everything. And yeah. I think there genuinely is conflicts out there that we have to manage. Now they're saying you can't have any conflicts, but there are conflicts you have to manage. And I think asset-based fees potentially. And there's arguments on both sides of this, so I'm not going to try and blow up your you know, commentary on this, but, um, and potentially insurance uh, commissions are effectively conflicted in some way, shape or form. Um, so, I mean, I, in an ideal world, I'd like to move towards where it's nice and clean and I just get a fee and that's it. The reality is I've built a business where I've got some legacy stuff in there, but I'm going to gradually have to transition out over time before I can actually use that tag. So, yeah. Jeff? Uh, I think that, yeah, the, the independence argument um, has been skewed. Uh, I think it's got to do with if you're, if you're independently owned um, as someone like James is, and, and I know James' circumstances, um, where, where he owns the licence, um, there's not an influence from any other person, uh, yep. then, you know, the, the fact that um, some remuneration comes in because of a, an old trail book, does that make him not independent? Well, in the eyes of ASIC and the, the law, that's what they say. But I, I yeah. think that it's a, a, a long bow to draw. And having come from a, a, a bank owned licensee, um, I can tell you, I, one of the things that I looked for in, uh, in a new licensee was not being owned by an institution. So I wasn't apologizing for the you know, media headlines that were happening at the time. Yeah, I've worked with businesses before where they've come on board a licensee and six months later they're being asked why they're not writing this product. And I think that's, yep. that's, that for me is the main, even those businesses who are really open about it and they say, look, I'm not going to do that just because of it. I know there was some licenses that even had problems because their in-house aligned planners didn't want to write the product because, because of perception. You've got to remember, oh, sorry. I was just going to say, you've got to remember that the independence piece, the 923, was actually driven by the banks. So the banks made it that hard, so they weren't going to have any competition when it came in. So that definition is so strict because they made it that strict. Yeah. So, so I think the, Jeff's argument is very valid. I think it could be loosened somewhat uh, so. to, to be more encompassing of other advisors. Well, they have the thing in the UK where you're either going to be restricted or unrestricted. I don't know if that's actually correct, right, but I think it's the terminology which people didn't like. Um, yeah. Let's just, uh, I'm going to go through the question. This has been great, guys. Thank you so much. Um, Elizabeth says she thinks the biggest change that's going to happen is easier remote communication. Some people want face-to-face -face a lot, and that may no longer happen because they're, they're going to realize that they can get the same thing without having to uh, work so hard. Uh, Stephen, really interesting point. He says independence of thought versus product is probably going to be the thing that changes. 
Uh, Don made the point that existing clients don't value independence because they already trust you. And that's a good point. However, new clients' prospects will view it as a positive post the Royal Commission, subsequent loss of... I, I think that's a fair point. I mean, I think it's important to, to separate them into existing clients who typically, the research says, have really high net promoter scores versus prospects who haven't experienced it and therefore uh, are less trustworthy. Let's jump into some questions. Uh, I'm just going to pull things out. Sam, you know, let's ask this question. Gents, when you were out there looking at licensee services or even the people who were supporting a licensee, what were the main offerings, what were the main proposition components which you ranked most highly for you and ultimately would, you know, made you make a positive decision as opposed to a negative one? Was it marketing support? Was it outsourced para planning? What were the things? I, I did have a need for para planning. Um, yep. I have an in-house para planner, but the guys that I work with uh, needed outsourced para planning. So that was something that was a, uh, a need for me. Yeah. What else? Uh, my ours was around, really around compliance of the license. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and having a network of other advisors in that same boat that you could draw resources from. Um, so I think that's important. And when you say network, does that mean just having like the licensee or the, the, the approaches to the licenses actively get people together or just knowing that there's other people? Other, yeah, so other AFSL holders, for example. Okay. Yeah. People that are in a similar situation to us that have, you know, understand the the challenges of running their own license. I think that's been important to be able to utilize that network. Uh, so to, to community, to, sorry? Community. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Anything else? No. Cost. 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 Yep. Anything which, you know, when it was presented to you as being a real differentiator, you looked at it and went, no, not even close. Mm. I think it's interesting how many talked about their their software. You know, we, we have our own uh, you know inbuilt version of of X Plan, uh, or in a, the licensee I joined, we have our own proprietary software. Um, software, software. <laughs> Fair enough. You know, James, anything else? Yeah, I think the software thing is interesting because I think uh, we we've had that scope to do what we wanted to do on the software side. Um, and I don't, I, I, I've spoken to you about this before, Stu, I don't think it's a, a one piece of software solves the problem. I think it's yeah. having a stack of software that does various things, yeah. uh, but they all effectively can talk to each other. And that's what we've tried to build. I'm not saying we've got it 100% right, because we haven't yet. Uh, yeah. But I know what some, some of the software we're using is so much more advanced than anything else, you know, anything that X-Plan could potentially do from an engagement point of view. So, yeah. you know, so there is, there is that. That's a good point. Unless you're absolutely certain of, uh, that your software solution can support the kind of business models that you're, you're out there, forcing people to use it is gonna create more problems. And look, I've spoken to Michael Kitsis about this before. One of the biggest problems in the industry is the people who use, who, the people who the software is sold to are not the people who use it. And that's, that's breaking the golden rule of, of software development, unfortunately. Yeah, agreed. Okay. Um, the reason why Sam's asking is um, it's interesting. A lot of businesses are now going down the route of saying, you know what, we're going to start our own specific licensee. We're going to like uh, absolute Sydney, these kind of, uh, and we're going to build it up from the ground off based around that very clear fit. We're going to do certain things for certain people. And that's, that's the route that Sam, um, Sam's going down. So uh, yeah, I think getting, I, I think Don made the point as well that um, where is it? The ability to inter interact with a high quality peer group community is the biggest plus to the dealer group. And he made the observation that unfortunately not a lot of them, not many of them have that capability um, actively in engaged. Mm -hmm. um, let's just ask a couple more and then respectful of your time. Yeah. Stu, can we go to JC's question? Yeah, totally. I know she, I think she's true. Uh, yeah. Question for James. Go for it. No. Which one was it? <laughs> what, what sort of revenue would you recommend a sole trader was yeah. generating before obtaining an AFSL? Oh God, James. Uh, well, I'm just. I think you've got to look at what the cost of running your AFSL is. So generally, it will be less. So I know when we moved from charter, we were paying about 80k a year, uh, and with everything that dropped to about 50. 
So it's, it's if you want to do it on percentages, you know, uh, if you can run off 5% or, you know, some licensees charge up to 10% of revenue, didn't they, in the old days? So, I mean, like, so I, I think you would want to have, you probably want to be five, six, seven hundred up, to be honest, to make it viable. It's, uh, yeah, I, I think obviously the bigger you are, the, the easier it becomes because it's a flat fee to run your license generally rather than a percentage based fee, which is what obviously some licensees charge, not all. Uh, so I would suggest, and some of them have caps, of course. Um, yeah, for us, it's about 50K a year to run our license, roughly. Given what's going on right now with a lot of licensees, you know, tapping practices on the shoulder and saying you don't have enough money to be part of our group, which we can talk about the moral, moral ethics of that given the current environment. I think if you look at the level of which they're tapping people on the shoulder, you know, which is typically under a half a mil usually, Mm. They, if you if a licensee can't enable themselves to run you as part of a group, you are going to probably find it really really challenging to run your own AFSL. Uh, that's probably a rule of thumb, which probably a lot of people may not want to hear. But I, I definitely, if you're under that level, I definitely ask whether going from a licensee who can't support you to your own licensee is necessarily going to be a good choice. Would yeah. you say that's fair? I think that the reality of where we're going, if things carry on on the same trajectory in terms of legislation, running a, let's call it a one man band advice firm is going to be very difficult going forward from a yeah. compliance point of view, in my opinion. But um, who knows, maybe all this coronavirus will change the way we give advice. Maybe the government will come to their senses. Can, and we'll can, I, get... dis can I throw a disagreeing view in there? Because I actually sure. think the reverse. Okay. I think running a one man band is not the expensive part. Okay. I think I think running a a multi advisor firm is where the risk in, is involved because you've got um, you know the potential for somebody to give advice contrary to what the law says that you should do because you're not doing it. And so you're, when you're, you're when you're the license holder and you're the one providing advice. You're taking the responsibility there for every piece of advice that goes out. So yep. this, this is a situation where you've got, like you've got a corporate authorised representative yep. structure and you've yep. got people who are over there. Essentially, that they are part of your group, but they might not be aware of it. They may think they're running their own show, right? Possibly, that's, yeah. That's, that's, yeah, I, I agree with that. That's, that's, um, that is a dangerous situation. Hmm. Cool. Gents, this has been absolutely awesome. Thank you for sharing. Um, any other questions before we go, please pop them in the box. But final word, where do you think, uh, where do you think this is all heading? What's your biggest tip you can give over the next 12 months for businesses regarding licensee transition and all of those elements? James. Uh, I, think, I think the first thing is we've got to get through this next six months, right? So the first thing I would say is you've got to communicate, communicate, communicate with your clients as much as you can. We've been actively doing that. Um, you, I don't think you can communicate too much in this environment. If you think you're communicating too much, you're probably doing it about right. Yeah. Um, uh, so keep doing that. Uh, I think once we get through the six months, I really hope, uh, what my, my hope is, is that we can actually get to some sensible resolution on this legislation. I hope this coronavirus actually makes people realise that under the code of ethics, maybe we should be giving advice like lawyers do. We don't have all these stupid SOAs to do. I'm not saying you shouldn't give clients information, but you know, you're going to get pinged on the code of ethics if you do the wrong thing anyway. So an advice document is not going to make much difference, right? So I think you know, if we could take some of the burden off advice firms and um, you know, allow us to actually do our job, which is give advice, uh, you'd actually reduce the cost to serve and you'd actually in these difficult times for many, you'll get advice out to people that actually need it. I, I, I hope this is a Pied Piper moment. If yeah. Yeah. Um, I hope so. Jeff? Uh, I think from a, a change of licensee perspective that uh, if you, you are looking to change your licensee, um, whether it be to go out on your own, uh, don't make costs the number one thing. Uh, there's a lot of cheap licensees out there um, uh, there's a lot of licensees that are going to put their costs up 
you know, work on what, you know, make sure that if, if you're going to a licensee, make sure they're the right licensee to work with you and they can provide you the support that you need. Love it. Gentlemen, thank you so much. Everybody, I hope you've enjoyed this. Uh, I have, as always. Um, guys, uh, stay safe. Uh, you too, I hope you've got an interesting weekend to plan, though I imagine it's probably at home, right? Yeah. Sure. Um, but other than that, guys, uh, yeah, take care. Um, if you're on the drop-in, I'll see you a bit later on. Other than that, have a great weekend. I'll speak to you soon. Cheers. Thanks, thanks everyone. Right see you soon. Bye.